And I've got a microphone because I've been a bit old, so I'm quite quiet when I talk a little bit. Um, as Lisa said, my name's Dave. Um, I drove here from Canterbury and I only owned a car for less than a week. So it was quite a scary trip. I agree. It was, it was interesting. Um, but it really got me thinking on the car journey and then the time leading up to this. Um, all about mission, and that's exactly what I'm going to talk about tonight. And I'm going to be looking at three different relationships uh, that we can have and, and just some stuff around mission with the theme to inspire everyone here to get excited about God's mission and God's plans for Folkestone and this area, everything uh, that's happening. And I want to shape everything that I say, just through we worshiping, this really came to me. Uh, last night I had the, the privilege of uh, emceeing and hosting an event with Hillsong, Young and Free, uh, which was fantastic. We packed out a um, whole church in Canterbury with 360 people, uh, which had an amazing night of worship and loads of stuff happened. It was fantastic. But just in the midst of all of that, uh, a young person that I've been praying for for about two months now, three months, and meeting up with regularly, uh, became a Christian last night, which was absolutely fantastic. And just as we were worshiping, I was probably reminded that actually like, every part of my journey with him has just been impacted by different types of mission and different activities and stuff. And so I really want to frame all of that uh, with this story of me and this young person uh, over the last few months. So first of all, what is mission? Uh, today I got off at nice and early at 7 o'clock and I walked down to Kids Club and I walked back from Kids Club afterwards and somewhere in between that time I lost my house keys. So today I've been on a bit of a mission to try and find my house keys. They're still unaccounted for somewhere in Canterbury. Uh, which is not a good thing. But that's one, one mission that, if you like, I'm on over the next few days to try and reclaim those house keys that I've lost. But the mission that we're talking about is quite different. And that's because the mission we're talking about is so much bigger. I'm always reminded of just how big God's mission statement really is. And God's uh, mission statement for the church couldn't be much bigger than Matthew 28, where Jesus says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey the commands that I have given you. And the thing about that is that the command in there is not just to the people you like, to the people you know, or the people down your road, or the friend next door, or the nice old man at the end of the street that you chat to on your way to work, but actually to every single nation, every single person on this earth. And there's almost 7 million people on this earth, so that's no easy kind of one solution fits all challenge that we've got ahead of ourselves. Well, I want to home in on these three relationships. And those are relationships with ourselves, the relationship we have with the church, and the relationship that we have with each other as a result of those things. I think the first thing I want to encourage you on, but also challenge you on, is the relationship that you have with God yourself. Because in order to get motivated and inspired for mission, you actually have to be inspired by Jesus first of all, because if you're not inspired by who Jesus is and, and what Jesus has done and what God has done for you, then you're going to have a really tough job trying to communicate to somebody else the excitement and the wonder that God has represented to you. And so our motivation has to be Jesus in order to see Jesus in our lives, to see Jesus transform other people's lives. Because if we're not excited about it, how on earth are we going to get anyone else excited about it? It's like if you go to a really boring film and someone asks you afterwards, oh, how was it? You'll go, yeah, it was really boring. Um, or you might say, yeah, it was actually okay. And you're not excited, you're not interested. And what, if we're like that with the church, and if we're like that with the message of the good news, then actually all that's going to happen is people will be like, oh, I'm definitely not going to see that, I'm definitely not going to turn up to that, because it just sounds boring and okay, as we said at the moment. And I think one of the big encouragements from this, though, is that when we do actually do that, when we do start to pursue God, then others actually start to catch on to that. And I just want to quickly share, at the very start of three months ago, my journey with this young person. I was uh, meeting up with one of my young people to mentor them for coffee. Uh, we'd arranged to meet up, and we were stood outside Starbucks, and I was ready to go in, and it was going to be good, and it was, everything was set up. And uh, just a couple of seconds before he arrived, he texted me saying, my mate is stuck in town and he can't get a lift for half an hour. Is it okay if he comes to coffee with us? And part of my head thought, no, because we're actually going to be discussing you know, some serious stuff. We, we can't just have other people that I don't know around. Um, but I felt, I felt that, yeah, okay, I'll let him come along. So we sat down in the top of Starbucks in Canterbury and I felt really challenged to be quite honest with him. So I turned to him and quite bluntly I said, um, we're actually going to be discussing Jesus stuff, so you might get a bit bored, but um, that's basically what we're doing. But he said, oh, okay, that's going to be a bit weird, but um, I'll sit and listen to you. So an hour and a half later, we were still sat there, 
uh, listening to this kind of in on this kind of session that we were talking um, through some big questions and, and just catching up about life. What really struck me was the fact that he was so interested in the fact that we were just sat there talking about stuff. And this really started me off on this kind of journey with this young person. I said, well, why don't you add your Facebook? Why don't we catch up um, and, and see what's going on in your life? And he was like, yeah, that sounds good. Um, and so I said, yeah, great. And that brings me on to the relationship that we have with the church. I've been involved in quite a lot of mission um, since I became a Christian when I was 17. Uh, not all of it exciting, not all of it successful, and not all of it had, had, had great outcomes. Uh, and I've seen some fun things happen during mission. I think a particular failure highlight for me, because um, I think it's always important about that we're honest with the failures that we have in mission as well. Because it's easy for someone like me to get up there and say, yeah, it's going to be really easy, it's going to be great, and you're going to go out there and hundreds of people are going to become Christians. But actually, that might happen, but equally it might take you five years of loads of failures and loads of hard graft to work out on the streets of Folkestone before you see anything happen at all. I remember we were once cleaning the subways in a, in a town near where I'm from, and we were stood there with our high vis jackets on, our big rubber gloves and our big sponges and there was loads of water and it was great fun and I was trying to someone. And this uh, little boy, there must be a group of pensioners, came past and they stood in the subway looking at us and one of them turned to me and said, well it's good to see that the young offenders are doing a good job in our subways. Um, and so I turned around and tried in my best uh, 17 year old voice uh, to explain how we were actually Christians and we were doing this because we love God. But they weren't really buying it at all. They literally thought I was lying, which was quite interesting and funny. But to me, I was looking like, I'm, I'm really not. I'm not a young offender. Honestly, we're not. We all look like we are, but we're really not, honestly. But they just wouldn't believe us. And um, I found that quite, quite interesting uh, as an experience. And sometimes people will look at you when you're out doing this and think, oh, they must have done something wrong because this is payback uh, for something. And that's often what people view it. But I think, wouldn't it be great if actually the next time uh, those pensioners walked through a subway and saw a group of people in high vis jackets clearing the subway. They said, hey, you know what? Wouldn't, isn't that the church? Isn't that, wouldn't that be great if that was a precedent for what people thought when they saw someone clearing up litter or when they saw someone cleaning the walls? They didn't think instinctively, oh, they're definitely going to be young offenders. But actually they thought, hey, those must be those Christian people that do all that stuff. Um, I think that would be fantastic. Another thing that I've been involved in uh, is we at home we had a, a youth project and we were out on one of the estates at home and uh, we were asked to pray, uh, to go into little groups and pray for different areas and then we ended up in some weird conversations with some of the local residents which was a bit different to what I expected it to be and quite scary um, but after a while we just got thinking well hang on a minute, if this is God's mission then there has to be a purpose and so I think it's really important that we're honest about the church um, I find it really easy sometimes to, to talk to people and not use the word church and not talk about you know, the whole Jesus bit. Uh, instead we're like, hey, we're running a, a kind of a, an event and there's going to be music and there's going to be food and stuff and uh, come along, it's going to be great. And, and what we always do is we, we forget that the whole reason we're coming to this event and we have food and music is actually because God's there and that's why we want to come. Um, and, and I think it's so important to be honest about that. I said to this young person um, who I'm going to keep referring to, uh, I said to him, he, he texted me one day saying, you know, I, I want the help of your kids club thing. Um, and, and I said to him, okay, well, it's quite, um, quite Christian. Um, I don't know whether you're going to want to come. He said, no, uh, I'm happy to help out. My mum does play school or something. Um, so I'm used to dealing with kids. So I thought, well, you're not used to dealing with these kids. Uh, but you'll have a great time. Uh, we'll see what happens. So he came in and we sat down. And I remember... Uh, we were still in the church, and uh, this is a church that I find, you know, could be a little bit dull at times. I think most of us find church sometimes a bit dull. We sat there, and um, someone uh, in our team got out a hymn book. Um, I haven't seen a hymn book for a long time, so I was a little bit worried about what was going to happen next. And he opened it to one of his favourite hymns, and I thought, oh, great. This is a great first church experience for this young person. And he began to sing a cappella. Um, this hymn, and it, let me tell you, it was not good singing at all. Um, it was very interesting. Uh, the melodies were very all over the place, and uh, the team began to join in. Um, and I kind of sat there thinking, "Great, this is the greatest mission that's ever happened." Not. Uh, how is this young person going to feel? It's their first experience in church, their first time in any kind of building like this, where you know, apparently we're praying or worshiping like Christians worship. And we stood there for a good five minutes, and me feeling really cringed out. 
Um, and, and then we kind of finished and we put the stuff down and I thought, right, now we've got to really try and make that back up. Um, but he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, hey, can we, can we go off and chat? And I thought, hmm, okay, you're going to tell me that was really weird. Um, and, he, and he started off his sentence by saying, that was really weird. And I thought, great, I agree with you. <laughs> but then what happened was he actually said something that literally blew my mind um, over the last three months. Because he said, um, is it weird that I've, I've kind of got this feeling inside of me and it's like there's something in me and, it, and it's kind of like a joyous thing um, and, and something's happening, I don't really know what to do. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, what, like, where, what, what's going, what do you mean? And he said, well, just when we started singing, um, I just felt this, this presence um, come over me. I'm not really sure. Um, should I go to church? Um, and I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. So I turned around and I looked at um, my team that had been doing this and I thought to myself, well, actually, should we be selling the church? Because, yeah, sometimes we stand in church and it's, it is dull and it is boring. It doesn't fit what we, we think it was. But, you know, God actually shows up and God shows up in big ways. And to me, I just stood there looking at this young person thinking, Oh, God's just showing up in his life for the first time. He's never, he didn't even think of the concept of God before today. And he's walked into a church in his first ever time in worship and the Holy Spirit has just filled him. And now he doesn't know what to do. And I thought, great, what a fantastic problem to have. Let's have more of those problems. Um, let, let's have that more. And that's my heart for mission is that our relationship with the church should be one where we're completely honest about the fact that, yeah, church can be the bold, but you know what? Actually, church is amazing because God's there and God's going to show up and God's going to do big stuff. And if we believe that, then that's exactly the place that we're going to take people into. And that affects every single relationship we have with each other. I think when we're thinking about mission and, and some points for, for when we later start thinking about what that's going to look like you know, practically and stuff, I think it's really important to remember um, the importance of the longevity in mission. Um, I've been involved in quite a lot of day missions and, and weekend missions and those kind of things as well. And they're fantastic and there's a really important place for you know, one day big push to, you know, to take the word out onto the street. But there's also a huge important part of this which is all about long term mission. And the ultimate goal of long term mission is for relationship and ultimately relationship for that person with Jesus. And be prepared for the long haul in that. Uh, sometimes we, we, we gather in places like this and we gather together for to thinking practically about mission. It's really easy, you know, just to think, well, hey, there's that place down the road that I know. And yeah, everyone agrees it's really dirty, so why don't we go and clear up the litter? And we can do it on a Saturday afternoon in an hour. We can come back and we can feel good about ourselves. And fantastic. We, we've loved everyone and it's fantastic and we're going to see loads of stuff from that. But actually, that's, that's not how it works, because you might go and clear that, and you might feel good about yourself, but essentially what you've done is a social action project. You've not really done a mission, you've not engaged with any long-haul relational mission, you've not really tried to, to reach out to those people. All you've done is stood there and go, well, we'll do that, and then we'll feel good about ourselves. Um, and and a kind of just a, a story that I, I thought about to do with this would be, you know, imagine if someone was, was out one day and they were seeing you clearing the litter on their own, um, and they, they went to buy you chocolate. Um, the story ends well um, for you, so think about this. And then uh, they went to buy you chocolate, and they went to the shop, and by the time they came back, it was a couple of hours later, um, and uh, it was a very long way away shop. And uh, you'd gone, uh, and, and you'd finished your mission, and you, you, know, you felt good about yourself, and you went back to your church and everything, and, and you disappeared off. You know, that guy would probably be like, oh, I was going to give you chocolate. And he goes back to his house, and he never has a conversation with you, but you know, if you went back to the next week, or the next month, or the next year, and you did the same thing again, that guy might come out and be like, oh, aren't you the guys that came last time? And you'd be like, yeah, actually we are. I remember when we were um, up on the state at home, we were running a football project, and I was playing football with some teenagers, and I was talking to one of them, and I was like, well, how on earth did you find out that we would be coming up here to play football? Because we literally brought a ball to a club, and he said, because every few months, and it's the same weekend, I think it was, every few months, the church came out and played football in that park. And every few months, the same group of young people came out and uh, played football with them. And that, and that really spoke to me about what it is to be in it for the long haul. Because it's really easy to get caught up in the, in the moment of feeling so good about what we've achieved on the ground there. But actually, God calls us, we read the Gospels, about long-term relationships with each other uh, and the people that we meet. So we have to be prepared for the long haul so that people are not just projects, but they're relational. Um, and every intention that we have and everything that we do is geared up towards relational mission to other people. 
And that doesn't mean there isn't a place for practical outworking. Um, I was involved in mission in Canterbury a few months ago. We, we spent a whole two hours clearing up the litter um, on, on the street that I now live, which is quite cool. Um, that ended well. Um, and we did this for a couple of hours and we went back to church. And the great thing is, is that as a church, we know so many people down that road. So that every time I walk down the road, you know, I chat to someone on the way home, whatever, there's this instant connection of, yeah, I'm the guy that came and picked up the litter. I'm also the guy that goes to the church around the corner. And I'm also the guy that lives next door to you. And so people get to have this amazing opportunity, I hope, to come and talk to me about anything. And, and we did the same with our neighbours. We went around to our neighbours, but then we moved into our house. Um, and this is a kind of a failure of mission story. And I really wanted to share it because it really spoke to me about what it sometimes can happen uh, when we get really keen as Christians. Uh, we sat together as a house, and there's four of us. And we decided that we would uh, go and be really you know, missional to our neighbours that we live next to. So we break back, break, uh, baked brownies even um, for a whole afternoon and decided that we'd go and walk down the street and knock on all the doors and give people free food. And it would be great and we'd get new people coming to church and it would be fantastic. Uh, we started off with our neighbour because we thought that would be a safe place to start. So we opened this door and uh, we said, hey, we're from next door, we've just moved in. We've got some brownies that we'd love to give you. Um, you know, we're new around here, it'd be great to you know, chat to you, how are you? He said, I'll take your brownies, maybe, but I think this is just because you're going to make loads of noise throughout the year, um, so I don't want them, really. And so he said, no, 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 we're, we're not going to make any noise, we're, we're literally just giving you brownies. And he said, what have you done to them? And we said, no, no, we, we just literally have moved in next door, um, as in the door there, um, have, have brownies. Um, and so he, his son took them. And he stared at us for a while, um, and then I love the fact that he just stood there, and then we went, you're students, aren't you? And we replied, no, no, we've actually got jobs. And he looked again, feeling very concerned, um, and was like, hmm, okay, well, we'll maybe see you about, um, and tried his door. And that was that. Um, but the great thing is that we still see him, you know, at least once a week, walking past, and we always give him a wave, and a, a very different, on the way to work kind of look. <laughs> so yeah, that's the um, I'm sure he must think that we're students because we do all the student stuff, but we just um, also work as well. But the thing is, is that sometimes we get key. But I don't think that that guy really was that affected by brownies too much. And it wasn't the brownies that affected him, but every time we talk to him, it's those conversations that we build up. The same across the road. We are, I live opposite a Chinese, which is exceedingly bad for your health um, because it's very easy, especially when you know the person. Um, that runs it as well. But we always go in there, we started chatting to the family and, and the couple that own it. And the amazing thing is, is that we actually get to know something about them. You know, we're not just going in there being like, hey, we're going to order Chinese, goodbye. But actually we get to go and be like, yeah, how's things going? You know, how's this going? How's that going? Oh, I heard about that. And, and it turns out their son is my housemate's sister's old school pupil or something like that. And we just have this amazing relationship that we started to build with the family. But I think God's really spoken into the fact that we're living in a community. And that's the big thing that I really want to put across tonight, is that when we're engaging with mission, we have to think about the community. Because we're all part of a community. It might be your street, it might be your school, it might be your, you know, your church, it might be just your local area. But you're all part of a community of some kind. And the thing is, in this 21st century Britain, we actually probably don't know many people down our road. Um, I don't know half the names down my road, I, I just see the ones that look scary and avoid them. But actually there's so much that God wants to do with each and every neighbour that you have. And that's the really important thing, and that's what we've got to press into tonight. Is actually what is God's heart for the people that you're going to see tomorrow morning, that you're going to see the day after and the day after. Because it's so easy to think, well, you know what, uh, I can come down here, I could come to Folkestone next week and do evangelism on the street. And I probably wouldn't know anyone, so I'd feel quite comfortable. Um, and it'd be great, and it'd be fun, and stuff might happen. But how much harder is it to do that to the people and to share the good news with people honestly about the church, honestly about the cross that Jesus died on and then Jesus' resurrection? How difficult is it to share that with the people that we see day in, day out, down the street, down the road? And you know what? I bet that some of us live in, in areas where actually there's so much hurt and there's so, much, so many problems and so much damage that people have in their life. And, wouldn't it be great if the church could be the main place in Britain where people go, hey, I've got a problem, you know where I'm going to go, the church? I think that would be amazing. I was in church uh, a couple of weeks ago and I was sat, um, and I, I let someone in and 
my vicar came out and, and spoke to him. And it turns out this student had been wandering around and he'd lost all his money. Uh, and he came into church as a last resort. Apparently he'd been everywhere else. And he said, I need to go home, but I've got no money for the train. Can anybody help me out? And I immediately smiled and said, great, great. Even though it's the last resort, even though it wasn't the first place he went to, something in that guy's mind, he's not a Christian and he hadn't been to church and anything, he was quite worried about asking in church, but the thing was that he knew somewhere in his heart that the church was the place where he could come and go help. I need a bit of support here. And actually we were able to give him support and I, I was just so touched by that. Um, I was at a meeting in Surrey last week as well, um, Lisa was there as well. As, as I arrived, um, oh, it was me and Lisa arrived, we, there was an extra person sat around the table and um, I kind of thought, well, I don't recognise that person, um, which isn't a normal occurrence of these things. And um, I thought, oh, I wonder who this is, is this a, a new person that we get to have the fun of a meeting? But it turned out it was a homeless person that had been sitting outside the church um, all the afternoon, but someone that had got to the meeting first had decided to invite him and we'd give him sandwiches and coffee, and they sat with us. And it was great, and we had this great opportunity in the, in the, in the heart of a, of a meeting about, you know, planning youth mission and all that stuff to, to sit and actually physically do mission. Um, and I think it's so easy, it could have been so easy for us to say, well, hey, we've got a really important meeting, sorry, we can't help you. But actually, so many times in the gospel do we see Jesus just turning up to faces and saying, you know, I did kind of have, you know, somewhere I was walking to, but hey, there's a problem in front of me, and, and that's what I need to do. Um, I love that thing. Um, that about Jesus because so many times in the gospel Jesus is stood there and someone just comes up to him. Jesus preaching in the house, um, and this is a story I want to close on before I share what's happened to this young person. And Jesus stood in this house and all of a sudden, you know, you can imagine the scene, a crowded house and the roof opens and stuff must have fallen down. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't say it in the Bible, but it must have done. You know, if you can't hold on someone's roof, it doesn't just kind of float away. It falls down. So somewhere in this house, some people got covered by the you know, 2,000 year old equivalent of plasterboard. Uh, and, and they must have stood there covered in this stuff thinking, what on earth is going on? And, and as they stood there, this man is lowered from the roof. Now, I don't know if anyone works in health and safety, but I'm sure that's not a very safe way of uh, putting someone into a building. Uh, and, and they must have all thought, what on earth is going on? It would be easy for Jesus to turn around and be like, this is contravening every single health and safety rule. There's too many people in the house. There's now people on the roof. We're going to have to abandon the event and uh, we'll reconvene at a later date um, and I'll reschedule the tickets. But actually, what Jesus says is he stands there and as this man's going down, he's like, cool, well, you know what we're going to do? I'm going to heal this man. Straight away. There's no there's no quiver. There's no kind of like, oh, we need to have an emergency call meeting about this um, sudden change in the event that's happened. But Jesus just deals straight away with the fact that Hey, there's a, there's a sick guy in front of me. You know, what's my response going to be to that? It's not going to be, oh, you know, have I, have I ticked off the risk assessment for touching this guy because he might be affected with something. Jesus just walks over to him and prays for him and he, he gets up on his heel. And he walks. You know, he walks out of the house and you can imagine the scene that everyone else in there must have been like, what just happened to me? And I think that is exactly the heart that we have to have on a mission. Um, but yes, we do sometimes need to be worried about the risk assessment and the health and safety and making sure people don't fall off things and the rest. But our primary purpose is when we see stuff happening right in front of us. Maybe you walk out of your house and you see people hurting down the road. I was walking home the other night and I, I saw someone crying um, on the side of the road, a teenager. He looked really cool. Um, so I was a bit afraid to approach him. And, but as I walked past, I didn't turn around. And still, right now, I still feel like I should have turned around and spoken to him because something just gripped me from the inside that there was someone sat there in pain on the side of the road. Well, I don't know what his story was. Why was he crying? What was going on in his life? How can we be people that actually stand there? And we're not always going to get it right. And go, you know what? I'm actually going to stop my fast route to church. I was walking to church in all places as well. How can we stop and turn to those people and say, you know what? Let's, let's engage here. And we're not, it's going to be messy. And it's not always going to be perfect. And it's going to look very creative and all kinds of different things. But that's what's going to happen. So just to finish, a quick update on this young person. Uh, last three months we've been meeting up, but a, a couple of weeks ago um, we met up and uh, he looked at me and we, we hadn't said hello, literally hadn't said hello, and he said, hey, um, so I've met God and uh, I now have loads of questions about heaven, so we're going to walk and talk. 
Um, and I was like, hi, it's great to see you too. And then he just started to share all this inward kind of you know, stuff about you know, what heaven was like, and how it was going to be like, and you know, whether, whether he could choose stuff, and, and what free will meant, and whether you know, Jesus was real, and all this stuff. And it was amazing just to, to share with him. Um, and I just kept praying and praying and praying that God would work in his life. And he kept saying, I'll come to church, but it didn't materialise. And then last night, um, he turned up. Um, early, because some of his mates were there, and I said, come and, come and join us early, come and, come and be part of what we're doing. And then he stood upstairs and started talking to um, a couple of members of the, the Hillsong team, and, and one of them came up to me and said, um, there's this guy I've been speaking to that's not yet a Christian, but he's thinking about it. Do you know him? And I said, yeah, I think I know exactly who you're talking about. And then as I sat, um, when they did the response, I saw his hand go straight up in the air. And God just said to me, that's it. That's it. He, he's searching and he's pursuing. And yeah, I don't think that tomorrow he's going to come to all three services that we have at church and he's going to start wearing a cross around his neck and then eventually get a dog collar in a couple of years. But I think actually maybe there is something massive that's happening in his life right now. And I'm praying that tomorrow he's going to come to church for the first time and he's going to have another encounter with Jesus and that's going to be fantastic. You know, that's taken three months of, of prayer and that's taken three months of, hey, come to this, hey, come to this, hey, come to this, why don't we meet up, come to this, come to this, why don't we meet up? And the mess and the, and the difficulties that go with that. But I really want to say that that's just one example that it can happen and it will happen and it does happen because we read in the whole of scripture that God just meets people right back to the very start when Abraham is walking along a path one day, just going about his normal business, a daily stroll, all of a sudden a bush sets on fire and God says, hey, hey, how are you doing? And Abraham was like, whoa, there's a bush on fire and it's not burning. Right the way through to Revelation, when Jesus will return again and the bride and the bridegroom will marry. And that whole sense of the whole picture being complete, and we can be part of that when we engage in God's heart for mission. So that is my heart for mission um, for you and for Folkestone, that we would just be people that stop and look at the person that's crying in the street, that we would look at our neighbours, we would look at our community and think, you know what, what can I do? What can I do to help and serve and support these people? And it, it might be a small thing, it might just be a smile, but you know, it might be actually, you know what, I could buy that person dinner every once a year, every once a month, or once a week, or why don't we invite them around? Why don't we, why don't we connect? And then God will work in that. And it's going to be messy, and it's going to be fun, and it's going to be wild as well. And that's the